You're listening to Psych with Mike. For more episodes or to connect with the show with comments, ideas, or to be a guest, go to www.psychwithmike.com. Follow the show on Twitter at Psych with Mike or like the Facebook page at Psych with Mike. Now, here's Psych with Mike. Welcome into the Psych with Mike Library. This is Dr. Michael Mahan, and I am here on a bright, beautiful morning with my good friend, Mr. Brett Newcomb. Good morning. How are you? I'm great. Yeah, we were uh, talking off mic before we started this this morning about scheduling. And, uh, you know, this is the time of year when scheduling with Mr. Brett is a it's challenge. Complex. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're what? I'm traveling. You're I'm traveling, traveling because you because you're song? because you're retired. Tired. Yes. I am That's tired right. and I'm retired. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And so um you are uh about to spend a significant amount of time in Mexico. I am indeed. That's that's such a tough gig. I'm going to go down there for the Trump administration and select immigrants before they get to the border. Oh. So political Steve comments. Miller, Steve Miller asked me to do that. Uh huh. Yeah. Political comments made on the show, or after the, after he'd done a research on the solely of last the four generations of my family to see where we all lived and where we were. Person born. who's speaking, not. Yeah, uh, we were talking about having a disclaimer. Yeah. Should we have a disclaimer <laughs> that should, says they... people should only watch this show at their own discretion? Probably. <laughs> that they could be that easily offended. The participants are not responsible for any psychological harm. Well, I think just generally the participants <laughs> are not responsible. And actually, that's actually a good segue yeah. because what we wanted to talk about today is when people don't accept responsibility, right? Yeah, and uh, I am sure that this was something when you were actively doing therapy on a full time basis that you probably heard a lot in therapy. It is something that I hear a lot in therapy, and that is, you know, so and so treats me bad, but they won't acknowledge it. Right. What am I supposed to do? Well, I think where I heard that most in therapy was when people wanted to discuss with me their understanding of someone else's behavior. And I would keep saying to them, you know, we need to be talking about yours. You know, what's your contribution? Uh, How's this impacting you? What do you want to do about it? Mm -hmm. And you just want to tell me why you think they do these things that Mm -hmm. cause you distress. Because that gives me a a level of insulation from my awareness of my own participation. Mm -hmm. Uh, And to convey that message to somebody and get them to absorb it is a, is a real challenge in doing therapy. And, and you can work on it from the standpoint of every time they start to talk about somebody else, you know, the, the out there versus the in here, and you interrupt and point it out and say, you know, can you bring the conversation back in here? There are only two of us here or for three or four, however many you have in the room. Uh, can we talk about what you're thinking or feeling in this moment in this room? Well, I'm angry. Well, say, well, okay. Talk to me about your anger. Where's it coming from? What What are you angry about? Uh, when you get angry like this, what helps? What works? And I think that's super salient. The uh, article that I had sent that originally sparked us talking about this um, doesn't make that point distinctly. And I no. think that that is an incredibly important thing that anybody has to first realize is that you can only control you and as long as you're looking externally then you're always going to be disappointed and that really when people argue they argue about facts which turn out to be lies well that's why i used to say marriage counseling all the Mm -hmm. time whenever you discover that as a couple you're arguing about facts this is the third time this week that you didn't Mm -hmm. call me and tell me you're going to be late right it's only the second time the third time you know I, you've missed a point exactly. because you've already lost the moment uh, of any uh, ability to communicate or resolve. Then you're just scoring points. And, you know, as b- b- human brains are designed to find patterns, and so we always think, oh, my gosh, that's so crazy and ironic. But really, it's just how things happen. It's how people work. Yeah. But I've been thinking about this this week, getting ready to do the show, and uh, as it turns out, I've had several clients this week where we have discussed the idea of objective reality. Is there such a thing as objective reality? And, you know, the answer is really no, because even if we look at video, which is supposed to be objective reality, people still come up with their own 
conclusions and opinions. They have their own filters. Right, yeah, exactly, so, their own filters. So you would say that we have subjective reality, mm -hmm. how, how you define it. For instance, I was having this conversation with my son uh, about learning to like hot things, spicy hot mm -hmm. things. He doesn't like hot foods. And I said, it's an acquired taste. You have to learn to like them. The physiology of what happens on your taste buds is the same. Mm -hmm. But how you define that, was that a good or was that a bad, mm -hmm. is what makes it palatable for mm -hmm. you to eat spicy foods. And he, he's not there yet, so he's not you know, uh, willing to experiment. But I, I think that's a very salient message mm -hmm. that perception is reality. Exactly. Perception is reality. Yeah. And so if you're arguing about those facts, then you're only going to enhance the level of disagreement. So, so it gets complicated though, because, you know, we, sometimes we talk about comorbidity and people that are depressed, deeply depressed. And then I'm living with you and you're deeply depressed and, and I get frustrated at your depression. And I challenge you about it, you know, get up off the couch, take a shower, go to work, do something. You just can't sit here forever. And you say, oh, oh, but I can't because I am depressed. And what we have found in therapy is that very, very often depression is comorbid with anger. Mm -hmm. And that they can't own their anger. They can't identify it as anger. They can't express it as anger. And so it just oppresses them. The weight of their anger comes through the filter of, well, I'm depressed. Mm -hmm. That's what they call it because it's not acceptable to say I am angry with my parents. I'm angry with my wife or my mm -hmm. child or my boss in such a way that I'm almost immobilized mm -hmm. uh, because to acknowledge my anger means I would lose control. Right. And, and so when you start talking with people about learning to feel their anger, they are terrified that it's going to make them act in destructive ways. Mm -hmm. Or if you ask them to feel their pain, same thing. I'm afraid once I start crying, mm -hmm. I will never stop. So I can't mm -hmm. cry. And what you have to try to encourage them in perceptive uh, reality is you can cry for a little bit and stop. You can be angry for a little bit and stop. You can be angry without being out of control. Uh, and we can increase your tolerance level with experiences of that in this safe environment, in this therapy room. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I remember having a client that was so angry with her parents, but she was from a socially prominent family and she would, she feared that she would be ostracized by everybody if she mm. let anybody know she was angry with her father. And so she, after months of therapy of having these conversations, she was finally able to whisper to me, mm. I hate my father. Mm. But she, she moved her lips and said the words. Mm -hmm. I couldn't hear her across the room. Mm -hmm. Well, it was the beginning of a journey right. of looking at what about her relationship with her father made her angry. Right. And so then we were able to spend some time doing that and, and her life got better. So what I tell people is that if you're arguing about these facts, then you're arguing about lies because the other person has a different perception. And arguing about lies? Yeah, because the because your perception is your reality. And so that person thinks you're lying just like you think they're lying. Okay. And so what we take as facts ourselves are oftentimes perceived as lies by other people. I mean, that happens in the political re arena all the well, time. Well, yes, as Ke Kellyanne Conway taught us the term alternative facts. Right. <laughs> These are alternative facts. They're my facts. But, but a person would pass a lie detector test oh, yeah. based on the things that they, they report it. that they yeah. perceive. Yeah. So an individual's perception is their reality and it's truth for them even if it's different than your truth. And that's the first thing that people have to agree to is that we may have to agree to disagree mm -hmm. about the objective fact part, but what is immutable is how that makes me feel. So people always have to argue long enough to be able to identify how they feel. Once you say, when you, I feel now you can't contradict that. You can't tell me that I, I don't feel that way. I can't contradict that you feel that way. Exactly. But what I can say, if I'm able to be honest, is I don't give a damn. Well, you can. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't. And, and that gets to the crux of the matter in the relationship. If we're at the place in our relationship where I really don't care how you feel about my mm -hmm. behavior, then I need to make that clear. And then you have a choice to make. Exactly. Are you going to stay with me knowing mm -hmm. that I don't care about that? Or are you going to leave me? Uh, or are you going to leverage me in some way? Well, well or, if you don't, then we won't be doing this. So that, what I tell people is that, you know, if you say when you uh, don't call me, 
and tell me that you're going to be late, right. I feel uh, worried and then I get angry. What I need for you to do is be better about calling me. And you say to me, well, you know what? The truth is I don't care. I'm probably not going to change that behavior. Now the, the uh, first person has really three choices. You can say, okay, I'm not going to accept that. If you don't accept it, then you either have to say, I'm going to force you to change it, or I'm going to sit and brood on it and just still be distressed. Or you can say, I accept it. So if, if you posit someone's chronically late, and I can't stand to be late. Mm -hmm. And I say to that someone, when you're late, I feel undervalued, mm -hmm. unimportant, frustrated, anxious, what have you. Uh, so w I want, you know, can I have? And you say, no, I'm, I'm built that way. I'm always mm -hmm. late. Just plan, you know, tell me 7 mm -hmm. o'clock when you mean 730 because I'm always going to be 30 minutes right. late. I can accept that and mm -hmm. adjust my timing accordingly. Or I can say to you, if you're here at 701, I'm gone. Right. Exactly. And, and then I can do that. Exactly. Or, or I can just continue to have it be a bone of contention between us. Right. So that we always have something to fight about. Mm -hmm. right. And so then you say to that person, okay, which of those things would you prefer to do? Right. What you can't then say is, well, I would prefer, prefer that they change. No, you don't have that option. Yeah. That's the problem. Is they that, change. Right. Yeah. People always want to hold on to the option that is not viable well it's that aha moment you know parents will constantly say when is my son going to get it yeah you know uh and i would listen to them and i would always tell them you know if you hear yourself say how many times have i told you mm -hmm. you've already told them too many times exactly either let it go or put a consequence out there that mm -hmm. causes a change in their behavior mm -hmm. but Right. So if you said to that person, okay, at 7.01, yeah. I'm going to be gone. Now that person gets a choice. Now they can say, oh, that's, you know, scary for me. I don't want to think of you Proof as being... in the pudding. Yeah. 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 So people have to really start to recognize what is the limits of what they have control over. That's so odd that we always want to manifest control over other people. Well, because we want other people to change, not us. Right. Why, why should I have to change? I'm, I'm home cooking dinner and being uh, happy. And then I look up and realize you're a half hour late and mm -hmm. dinner's getting cold. And I, this is multiple times in a, a month. And I'm apparently not important to you. Mm -hmm. So then I build a whole case. I have an argument in my head before you get home about the things I'm going to imagine myself saying to you and the things I'm going to imagine you're saying to me and try to resolve that so that when you get home, I'm in a better place. Or I'm in a place where I'm fully loaded and just do a dump mm -hmm. of all the stuff that I've said the minute you walk in the door right. before I even know why you're late. Right, you know? right. I mean, because sometimes it might be relevant. I had a flat tire. Right. And other times it, uh, it might not be relevant. Right. You know? Well, and I, but I think that in those situations where, you know, sometimes there is a validity and sometimes there isn't, that still makes it really hard for people because how am I supposed to parse out when it's valid and when it's not? So, I mean, you know, you think about that with adolescent children, you know, sometimes if they're always late for curfew, right? well, sometimes there might be an actual valid excuse, but if you let them get away with it when there's an actual valid excuse, excuse, right. then they're going to assume that it's always okay. I had that conversation with my oldest son when he was a teenager. We had a curfew and he was late. And I said, okay, for every five minute block that you're late, then that's so many days you can't have access to the car. Mm -hmm. He was really distraught because mm -hmm. he stopped to help somebody mm -hmm. do something. And I said, I'm really glad you're that kind of person. I've raised you to be that kind mm -hmm. of person. You are that kind of person. Being that kind of person comes at a cost. Mm -hmm. And this particular time, it's going to cost you right. three days of not accessing the car. Right. I mean, but so we don't have an issue. And, and you know, but then he had an issue. Yeah. Because life is not fair. Right. I said, you're not two years old. Fair is a concept for two year olds. Right. It doesn't exist in the real world. Well, and, and, you know, learning that being a good Samaritan costs yeah. is actually a good lesson for people to know because it's true. Yeah. And so then you have to say being a good Samaritan is so enhancing to my soul that I'm going to choose to be a good Samaritan, even though I know that there is potentially a cost. Well, that's that's the script you want to try to teach them so that they can process that in their own internal dialogue. But then you run up against this whole thing of, of 
not being able to own my own responsibility. What's my contribution to this argument, this con conversation, this deficit of, of some kind? And sometimes I'm blinded by my own mm -hmm. ego, uh, my own hurt, my own anger, whatever it might be, so that I, I reject any accus accusation of responsibility. Mm -hmm. well, you, you, you know, when we hear ourselves saying things like, you always. Well, you always do this. So they're anticipating that I'm going to do it again. Mm -hmm. And they're already providing consequences for me in that anticipation. Mm -hmm. So when I get home, they're angry. You right. always right. do this. Right. You always say this. You never. You know, so you try to teach people not to use those global statements. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard. Well, and because your brain tends to lock you into those perceptions of universality and trying to challenge yourself to recognize that really nothing is ever universal is, is oftentimes difficult. The thing that, that uh, you know, I felt about the article is that the article that I had presented kind of makes the argument, well, you should agree with the person which is partially true. We've already said, okay, we understand that you have these perceptions that are your truth, but I didn't feel like that the article made any kind of connection to, but there should be a consequence anyway. But if you read the article, and the article is from Psychology Today, yeah. and it's entitled When Someone Won't Own Up to Their Bad Behavior. The example that they use is of a family of four. Uh, the older child is apparently normal, mm -hmm. nine, ten years old. Mm -hmm. The younger child is on the autism spectrum mm -hmm. and as a result demands so much more involvement and attention from everybody because of his inability to read social cues and his inability to control his own behaviors. Mm -hmm. So the older child begins acting out mm -hmm. to get attention because mm -hmm. all the attention in the family, in his eyes, seems to go to his brother. Mm -hmm. When he was once the star of the universe and got all of his parents' attention. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like Blue Jay babies, you know, fighting mm -hmm. for mom's attention. And so then they said, as the therapist, you get this kid in the room and you say, I understand that you are angry. I understand that you feel betrayed or a loss from abandoned the abandonment yeah. of your parents' attention. Mm -hmm. And that that in some way calms this kid because he gets verified. Somebody mm -hmm. puts words to what right. he feels in ways that that he wasn't able to articulate to his parents or they were not able to hear. Right. So then you say, then let's reality test this. Mm -hmm. If you continue to act out in school or get arrested by the police or, you know, whatever you've been doing, what good outcomes is that going to get mm -hmm. you? Because what we, what we know is that negative attention mm -hmm. is better than no attention. Exactly. And so children who feel like they're not getting attention will act out mm -hmm. to get negative attention if they don't think they can find a way to get positive attention. Mm -hmm. We'll prefer positive attention. Mm -hmm. So this article is suggesting that you give voice to their feelings. So mm -hmm. we're back to the conversation about feelings versus facts. And I'm 100% on board with that. Yeah. But I also think that there has to be an acknowledgement of, and if you continue to behave this way, this is going to be the cost. Well, that's a reality test. Yeah. I mean, because let's look at this realistically. Well, but the reality testing could be, what are your outcomes going to be? Are you going to like the outcome? Which it kind of feels a little bit softer to me than, okay, now if you continue to behave this way, there may be a consequence. So I, I can't remember the number of hours I've spent talking to adolescents who had misbehavior issues. Mm -hmm outside and inside the home because they were trying to force create situations that would force their parents to modify their behaviors right. yes and i would say to them you can't fix your parents mm -hmm. what you can do is make life harder for you or easier for you you can you can hold your breath until you, you put a date on the calendar and on this day i'm leaving home mm -hmm. you know, when i graduate from high school or or when i go off to college or, or whatever or join the army whatever it might be and then in the meantime, you can just do what you need to do to survive mm -hmm. without all this negative stuff. Mm -hmm. But what you cannot do, and it's the same conversation we have in marriage counseling, you cannot force them to change their behaviors. Right. You can just force them to uh, generate more negative consequences for you mm -hmm. and make your life worse. Mm -hmm. Is that what you want? Right. But I think that it is important to talk about what the potential 
costs are yeah. n- not because I think, oh, you know, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child, but because I think that in life, we are always faced with choices that have potential cost. And if we don't teach people to weigh those and understand those, be able to predict them and make an, a, a, an informed choice, then we're not giving them all of the skills that they need to be successful later. But so many of our parenting situations in particular, parents don't know or have the skills to clearly explain consequences no, so that mm, they are predictable. Because if they're not predictable, that's a whole show. you yeah. can't anticipate yeah. it. And so if you're going to try to articulate, here's a set of costs, then, then somebody has the ability to make a choice. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't want it to be that bad. Mm-hmm. You know, if you say this word to your mother, your dad's going to punch you in the nose. Mm-hmm. So you need to know that. Every time you say this word, he hits you. So if you don't want him to hit you anymore, could you stop saying that and, word? And we're not condoning hitting no, 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 the no, child, no. Right? But, but then the reality in these conversations, that's the kind of thing that happens. And so you're looking at the kid who's all violated and angry because his dad hit him because he called his mom a, a bad term. Mm-hmm. And the it, repetition compulsion in that family just keeps mm-hmm. that same thing happening. Mm-hmm. So you have to say, well, you have some power here that can be positive power. Mm-hmm. You can create a whole different script mm-hmm. if you choose to. So let's talk about how you do that. Right. And let's talk about what that might look like. Right. And then let's talk about what right. might come as a result right. of not repeating this behavior. But w- so we're agreed that, that we laid out for them to make choices. But yeah. part of the, the parenting conversation then that you have with the parents is you have to have consistent, predictable consequences mm-hmm. that you present to the child. Mm-hmm. If you do A, B, right. C, or D happens. Right. Regularly, that are that are that are known in advance and that yes. aren't then modified on the fly just right. because you're more aggrieved or had a bad day at work right. or whatever. Yes, that's Amen. yeah. And and so again, that could be a whole show the the consequence versus punishment thing. And I wrote that down in my notes because I definitely uh, want to talk about that. I say that all the time, and then I forget. Yeah. So I wrote it down in my notes. But uh, so basically. I think that, as you say all the time, even though uh, we use a lot of different language, even though we oftentimes couch it in different speech, in the end, therapeutically, we're really pretty much on the same page. And what we believe is that it's more important to identify feelings than it is to talk about facts that it is important to try and recognize what you have control over and what you don't, and that it's important to try and gauge or make decisions based on what the potential cost is and whether or not you feel like that is... I call it emotional economics. We talk about it all the time. Every choice you make costs, and every choice you make pays. The question becomes, can you afford the cost of your choices? Right. Exactly. Are you getting the payoff that you want? So hopefully this was beneficial. Um, As always, the music that appears in Psych with Mike is written and performed by Mr. Benjamin DeClue. If you want to get a hold of the show, please visit psychwithmike.com. And if it's Friday, it's Psych with Mike. Mm